So we are uh, very pleased to have a special guest with us connecting all the way from Latvia this morning. Our next speaker, uh, as Diardi said, is Colonel Sanders Gaugers, the commander of Latvia's Mechanized Infantry Brigade. He's had a long and distinguished career starting as an NCO and now has made it all the way to Colonel uh, commanding uh, the most important land formation in the uh, Latvian military. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, Colonel Hatton, uh, let me thank you for giving me, me this great opportunity to share my 50 cents of experience with this great bunch of soldiers and civilians. Well, before we go into my little presentation here, let me tell you this. Whatever Canada is doing to make their military leaders great, you are doing a remarkable job. Working as close as I do with Canadian military leaders for the last two years, I have met some tremendous soldiers, all of them being different in one or another way, but effective, professional, and inspiring leaders with whom I would not hesitate a minute to share a battlefield or trust with my life. Well, there are three things what I would like to talk about today. The first thing being multinationality and what challenges and opportunities it brings. I also need to talk about uh, task and purpose within the context of the EFP battle group, and then my command philosophy at the end. Now, since my English is not my first language, if you miss something or you do not understand what I'm saying, please note it down and ask me to clarify it or ask your questions at the end of presentation. Now, so here we go. Can I have a first slide, please? I never imagined how many high-level visits and engagements I will have as a simple tactical commander from military and political leaders across the globe. Now, last year alone, we hosted more than 350 visits and that is more than one every day. Initially, I was confused that it takes so much of my valuable time, which I could have spent on actually running the brigade. But later I realized that each and every EFP battle group sending nation spends so much money and effort on this operation that it is my obligation to explain firsthand what is that what we do here and how and why it is important for Latvia that you guys are all staying here as long as it takes. Now, two lessons out of this. First, if you think that high-ranking officials are never really interested about those small tactical things, then it is not true. Now, I had a Polish three-star general coming back to me after a year and asking detailed questions on progress of several things I briefed him a year ago. So people are actually listening to what leaders are saying and therefore never underestimate your impact on people around you. And the other thing is not becoming arrogant. Meeting so many presidents, prime ministers, chiefs of defense, and four-star generals, it might give you a false sense that you are so important that one-star general is not worth your time. Remember guys, we should never lose our sense of respect to other people, no matter how high we climb in our careers. Now, other point I have on this slide is learning from each other. As of today, we have 10 nations working and mechanized brigade, that's to not count Latvians. Iceland joined in September this year. Instead of Latvians going around the world and trying to gather international military experience and knowledge, you actually all came to us. For leaders, it is important to realize potential in every given situation and make the best out of it. So the last year, what we did, we paired up Latvian side of the mechanized brigade with the FP side of the mechanized brigade. And that brings me to the last point in this slide, 
is boosting brigade capabilities. So we paired up Latvian engineers with Spanish engineers, and we see tremendous development of Latvian engineer thinking and their work. Spanish engineers have been providing support to Latvian mechanized battalions, raising their knowledge and demand to Latvian engineers because Latvian units uh, understood now what engineers can and should bring to the battlefield. We have also paired I-STAR units, JTACs, artillery, signalers, logisticians. So all experience and expertise, what sending nations are, sending nations are bringing in fosters Latvian mechanized brigade capability development much faster than if we would need to develop all these things on our own. Excuse me. And then the last thing uh, worth mentioning on this slide is NATO doctrine. There are smart people behind all the standardization process in NATO. But let me assure you that most of the NATO countries at the tactical level have no idea about NATO and its standardization processes. If all sending nations would put some effort into readjusting their training and learning within their home militaries, it would ease and speed up unit integration within battle group as well as integration within, within the brigade. Well, that message is out to all sending nations, but I assume, you know, things take time. We have found our way around it and how we, you know, do things here, but eventually it takes much longer time than uh, the, the actual, you know, knowledge of the NATO doctor. Can I have my next slide, please? Task and purpose. And that is a big one. We are all simple army people, and we have to understand why we do what we do. The EFP battle group's mission statement says, deter and if necessary, defend. It is a task given without a purpose. Why do we do this? All NATO directions and guidances are set on deterrence. Part of the mission and we are pretty clear on how and why we do to the tier. However, there was not been a proper effort put into defend part of the mission. And I'm saying was because there's a lot of developments happening as we speak and, there, and the NATO plans are coming in place finally. Now the EFP battle groups are deployed to Baltics, Baltics, Baltic states and Poland for only one reason to reassure those four countries against any Russian aggression. However, perception of Russia as a threat is already a different thing in Europe, not even talking about North America. How many of you Canadians consider Russia as a threat? It is a hypothetical question, of course. Now, therefore, while NATO was struggling with agreeing on defense plans, and putting them into the game, we took a liberty on integrating EFP battle group into our host nation defense plans. Understanding that all decisions are made at the sending nation capitals, our philosophy is that it is better to have a plan than have a decision and then start planning. And I was amazed to watch it growing. Troops adjusted their training for those specific tasks in host nation defense plan. They drew their motivation for hard training and sleepless nights out of this defense plan. Interaction between units flourished because everyone understood that we are all into this together. Their, per their, their perception of their mission changed, understanding that one day it might be real. Receiving this task and giving an answer to what that defend part of the mission means closed the gap in soldiers' mind what and how we will do if things go wrong. Therefore, I encourage you all to look for and give the purpose to your soldiers, whatever you do, 
even if it is not clearly stated by the higher. Next slide, please. Now, my command philosophy, guys. Host nation defense plan, and then also NATO defense plans are driving everything we do here in Mechanized Brigade. My key statement to all troops is that we are on the battlefield already. Therefore, we have to make sure that this is advantage over the potential adversary is properly exploited. We are having numerous reconnaissance events in our given operational areas. Leaders battlefield circulations, historical briefs on battles happened there during the first and the second world wars. We go for a full brigade size exercises in our areas of responsibility. And we validate our defense plans down to a single battle position. We are putting effort into adjusting these plans out of the exper experience gained during these exercises. And I do believe that we have the most detailed and validated plans that has ever been made. We also love to say that we are not exercising, but we are rehearsing because all training is driven by what effects we have to achieve in the respective defense plans. Our key challenge in case of the surprise attack is to get out of the camp as quickly as we can with all the equipment and material required to win the war. We are clearly understand that there will be no returning back to the camp for resupplies. Therefore, one of my key efforts goes into the alert axis where we recall soldiers even on leave and getting out to our respective assembly areas as, quick, as quickly as we can. And again, we are getting better every time we do it and soldiers understand why do we need to do what we do. Always be ready is our mantra, but not just to get into the battle, but also come out of it alive. For us being a small nation, as well as small army, in comparison to the one on the other side of the border, it has been always depressing with EFP battle group arriving, our mentality is changing. And we are starting to believe in ourselves as well as in our capacity and capability to not have one-sided game. All of us, regardless of the nationality, realizes that if things go wrong, we will all be in the same battlefield. Our success depends on the weak, uh, weakest link. And therefore, everyone is working hard to not be that weakest link. Next slide, please. Now, this is my last slide, and it's not a rocket science, guys, but the key thing is lead by example. I mean, there has been nothing better than that, and it works no ma matter which century are, are we in. Either it's the 21st century, digital, or whatever it is. Empower your subordinates, because it, because it is not about you, but it is about your unit. Be clear, explicit, concise, constant, and simple especially in the international environment where you will find out that language is a challenge and you will have to make it work anyway. Relationship, uh, relationships are key. Be patient, flexible, and positive at all times. It is easy to get pissed of someone doing something wrong, but at the end of the day, there are ways around it to you know, make it work in a positive environment. Honor, humility, respect, and trust. Listen to advice from others. That's my last point. There are many smart people out there, guys. So probably, even though you are a commander or leader, you are not the only smartest guy in the room. And the last slide, please. And the last point is this. If you have a proper deacon, you can task him with everything you don't want to do. Sonny was a proper deacon for me. And I'm sorry that he had to leave, you know, uh, that soon. Thanks a lot. And uh, pending your questions. An opportunity to ask some questions to uh, Colonel Gaugers now. And uh, our moderators will be flashing those up on the screen here. Um, sir, now that you've worked with Canadian soldiers, 
have you noticed uh, differences in the approaches of leadership uh, by Canadian versus uh, Latvian troops? Now, generally, the difference is not there. I mean, each and every leader does his thing differently. One is more aggressive, one is more passionate, one is more friendly, and that's the same thing, you know, we do here in, in Latvia. The key thing is, I mean, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you make it work, as long as everyone, you know, understands what is that what you are trying to achieve. I cannot stress more, you know, the purpose for everything, guys, we do, because, you know, explaining why we do what we do, you, I mean, you're going to be amazed, you know, soldiers will follow you wherever you take them, but they have to understand what is the reasoning behind your decisions. There is a, well, there's an interesting thing, you know, uh, looking at, uh, at the battle group commanders coming out of, you know, different regiments as well as different uh, brigades and divisions. It is, uh, it is interesting, you know, but uh, that's, a, that's, that's a long story. Everyone comes in prepared, but everyone comes in different. All right, sir, uh, thank you. We have a question from a Lieutenant Colonel Fred Walansky, uh, and he says, I joined the reserves in 1981 and the regular force in 1983. That makes me a cold warrior, and I assume you are one too. Could you kindly name the three top significant changes from your side coming from the Warsaw Pact to NATO? Thank you very much. I think, you know, the, the most important thing, guys, is this. We are on the right side of the Iron Curtain now. So... I, well, I'm, I'm 47 years old. I never had an opportunity to join the Soviet army. So honestly, you know, I can't uh, treat you as my previous enemies. But, uh, but generally, uh, it, is, it is nice to be on this side of the border. Uh, that's, I guess, you know, the first uh, and the most, uh, most you know, valu valu valued thing here. Uh, as, the, as the militaries, I, I mean, I cannot stress more how important it is for us to get you all here in Latvia. And it's not only about, you know, reassuring that uh, if things go wrong, NATO will always be with us and, and, and we can rely on the, uh, the allies, but it is that opportunity what we have for learning from each other. I mean, you know, Soviets can be, or the Russians can be as good as they are. However, they are isolated as the nation, as well as the military. So for us, it opened up, uh, you know, the wholly new perspective on that there are other philosophies there. There are, there are, you know, other knowledge out there. There are a lot of things, you know, what we can share and, and what we can learn. I guess the, on the military side, like the, the last point I would like to say about this, uh, you know, it's, uh, I guess the command philosophy is different, you know, for the Soviets, and I do believe it's for the Russians the same today. I mean, it's that all military relationships are built on not trusting your subordinates and not trusting your, you know, uh, subordinate leaders. Now, we understand that for us, you know, it's, it's all about trusting each other. It's all about empowering the, the guys underneath you. It's all about making sure that your platoon commanders, your company commanders, and the battalion commanders, you know, they have their flexibility and their field, you know, where can they express uh, uh, the way how they operate, you know, within the task given. So I think that is probably, you know, that change uh, within, the, within the military uh, or the experience uh, what we have for, uh, with you guys. Thank you, sir. I think that's going to tie in nicely with uh, what General Rouleau will be speaking to us about power to the edge and uh, mission command philosophy and things like that. Um, our next question is coming from Lieutenant Colonel Derek Prendergast. Uh, he's asking, when and how does the Latvian army learn and train with NATO doctrine? Now, that is, uh, that is an interesting question. Let me tell you this, guys. We, we started in the 90s on uh, pretty much empty space. Because uh, we had officers, as well as the NCOs, uh, with the Soviet experience. 
And we started with, you know, adopting the knowledge they had. And then suddenly we realized that this is not the way how we operate. This is not the way how we want to operate. And this is not the way how we are intending to do things. We had to come up with something. And since one of the key uh, focuses for the nation, as well as the militaries, was to join NATO as quickly as we can after regaining uh, of our independence in 1991, then everything we did was going through each and every NATO doctrine they had, adopting those NATO doctrines and trying to work with those NATO doctrines as much as we can, because simply we had nothing else. So that was one of the, the driving factors where we actually learned, you know, things on, on the NATO side. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, our next question comes from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Eric Ross. And his question is, what are the challenges that Latvia faces in integrating and enabling contributions from interagency partners, the reserves and civilian segments of society with specialized skills like cyber as part of total defense uh, anchored in NATO Article 3 that focuses on pre-Article 5 resilience? Well, thank you for the question. And that's, that's a long question and a long answer, but uh, let me just try to uh, kind of summarize the whole thing. It's been last four to five years where we actually started to think about the home defense. Now, everything before that as well as, uh, as for the most of the countries in the West. It was our contribution to international operations, our contribution to EU, U, uh, NATO, or, or U, uh, UN missions. So that was where our effort laid for, for you know, at least uh, 20 years. Now, everything will happen in Ukraine, where we all kind of wake up and realized that at the end of the day, it is all about, you know, whatever we had in the, you know, the Cold War, it's all about, you know, kinetic operations. And at the, at the end of the day, it's all about us being self, uh, able to, to self-defense and self-defend. You know, that's where we started to, to figure out, so how are we gonna do it? And uh, then we realized that we will never be able to come up with a number of professional soldiers as, as you know, as we, would all like to, you know, have. For example, the, the Netherlands, which is, uh, is uh, one third smaller than Latvia, they have more than 60,000 professionals. We have roughly around six and a half thousand professionals. So we were well, trying to figure out, so how do we do it? And then the main effort for the last three to four years has been going into the National Guard or the Zemesards as we, we call it, or reserves. And the reserves are the ones who are uh, regionally deployed. They are the ones engaging with, with the, all the local agencies in their respective uh, areas of operation. Latvia is divided in four areas and we have four National Guard brigades. So these brigades are the ones actually making sure that if the things go wrong, they are interlinked with all the civilian agencies uh, either it's municipal, uh, municipal police, either it's a state police, or it's uh, any other, you know, uh, agency or, or, or uh, organization which might be of assist. On a cyber side, though, uh, it still belongs to the National Guard. We have organized it that all the... Here, uh, we have organized that all the... Uh, cyber specialists are a part of the National Guard uh, uh, organization, and they've been working hard in support to the MOD as well as the military institutions. All right, thanks, sir. I'll just ask our moderators to give me a bit more zoom on the monitor here so I can read the question. Here we go. Thank you. Our next uh, question comes from Chief Warrant Officer Rodney Gallant, a former uh, RSM of 2RCHA that many of us know well, uh, now over in Europe. Uh, he says, sir, thank you for your presentation. Since today discussions are leadership focused, I would like to have a better understanding of your thoughts of the officer NCO relationship within the Latvian military. Are your NCOs empowered in order to face leadership challenges at the lowest levels in order to operate in the future environment? 
The, the easy answer would be yes, they are. We are just celebrating 20 years of our uh, NCO Academy this year. And I had a great opportunity to be a uh, commanding officer of that NCO Academy a while ago. We have placed a lot of effort into empowering our, uh, our NCOs and making sure that, uh, that they are able to lead troops uh, if things go wrong, as well as on, on, you know, on, on, on daily basis. However, I would, I would argue that we still have uh, significant issues uh, at the, the higher uh, officer level because uh, the, it's at the end of the day, you know, it's a two-sided game. It's not about, you know, having powerful F officers and, and or the, you know, powerful NCOs. They have to understand each other and they have to understand that relationship. So if I can say that we have a great uh, NCO core, which is enabled and they know exactly, you know, what they do and how they do things, we still have problems with officers understanding clearly the role of NCOs, as well as, you know, enabling them in the respective uh, units. It's, it's all straightened out, you know, I would say at the, the, the platoon company and the battalion level, however, uh, brigade and higher, we are still struggling. But uh, I, I've always say, you know, things take time. We know what we do. So it's all about a matter of the time. All right, so, uh, thank you, sir. We have one last question from Lieutenant Colonel Derek Crabb. Uh, based on your observations, what is the greatest capability that Canadians bring to the fight? And what is the greatest area of improvement required to increase our interoperability? That is, uh, that is a complicated question. I think uh, my first engagement with Canadians was when I was uh, uh, working at J7 in Joint Force Command Brunson. And that's, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was one of the, pl the lead planners for the uh, Trident Juncture 15 LIVEX. And uh, since uh, Canada was uh, one of the, the nations taking uh, not just part, but taking lead in, in Portugal, and setting that exercise uh, piece on land up there, you know, I was amazed to look on how you guys, you know, taking the lead of respective task. And you will always commit more resources than required rather than, you know, uh, uh, not uh, fully, you know, uh, committing or, or just doing your job partially. So that is uh, one of the things, you know, what you are actually showing uh, uh, back here in Latvia, you have committed enough resources as well as human power and brain power behind it uh, that you are able to fully take control of that respective task and mission. And that is, I think that is, uh, you know, one of the key, uh, key things, uh, what everybody can learn if you actually, you know, you, if you take the task, then you have to properly resource it and it's better more resources allocated for the respective task than, than less resource. And uh, what the improvements, uh, I think uh, we've been, I've been having, you know, this is my fourth rotation of the battle group uh, uh, here in, in the mechanized brigade. And it's, uh, it's been, you know, great to to look how the battle groups are actually evolving so all those things you know which each and every battle group learns they are actually well uh, well handed over to the next battle group so it's like you know imagine me you know starting everything from scratch again every six months building the relationships you know understanding how the thing is going on and how it's run and, and as I said, you know, each and every leader is different. So that is, a, I, I'm sorry for the saying, but that's a, that's a painful task already. And if I would have, you know, to make sure that everything within the battle group is happening, you know, correctly, and we are not stepping on a, on a same, you know, uh, same, uh, uh, whatever you call it, same things again and again and again, or same mistakes again, you know, that would be more painful than, than, than it is already. So I don't really 
I honestly, there is nothing I would like, you know, think of what really needs to be improved in the way you guys are handling and, and leading things. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have. I want to thank you again on behalf of everyone uh, from dialing in all the way from Latvia and uh, giving us your perspectives on leadership uh, and integration with the Canadians. And I uh, hope to make it over to Latvia to meet you in person uh, someday. Thank Alors, you. Uh, maintenant...